I just uh, got back from looking at the to toy box video, and then for this year, that's uh, that's just huge progress from last year. And then last year was presence, uh, which blew my mind. So I can't uh, can't wait for the talks tomorrow to find out what uh, what they've got up their sleeve. Um, so I wanted to thank Oculus for the opportunity to speak, um, and I also wanted to thank them for uh, the developer community they've created with the forums and uh, with the uh, with this these set of sessions. It lets us speak, and I owe a lot to the community for uh, helping me get started with some of these uh, applications. So what I want to talk to you about today is uh, the thesis that good lighting, uh, good well lit uh, low light scenes. Uh, improve your player's experience. Uh, low light scenes happen all the time in real life, and there's no reason to believe they won't uh, occur also a lot in virtual reality. So when do they occur? They occur um, in artificially lit scenes, like the uh, a fire environment or the, uh, the lights there. They occur at dusk and dawn, twilight times. Uh, they occur under moonlight, in starlight, night with clouds. Um, they occur in enclosures when you're in a room that has curtains or uh, shielding from outside light. So um, low light scenes uh, will be important in VR also. These are all apps I had uh, the opportunity to work with. I worked with uh, Jesse Kerberger on Luna Station. And uh, Pastoral was actually developed because in the first two, they're both uh, space-based apps. Um, we kept bumping into low light situations. And uh, Pastoral is a test bed for looking at different types of uh, situations in low light. And so we were testing out different things. Excuse me. It was later gamified into, um, into what we checked into Oculus Share. Um, basically, it's an environment in the foothills uh, of uh, the Rocky Mountains. And you have a wolf or a set of wolves out there. And they're trying to attack sheep that are around you. It's a pretty simple environment. Um, and you scare away the wolf with a, uh, with a rock uh, by throwing it at the wolf. So I went into some detail there because we'll come back to that in a bunch of the examples. What, the way I'd like to uh, proceed with this is uh, first a little intro in you know, why, where this occurs in sci-fi, and then look at the different conditions uh, when you're working in low light. And this is mainly geared toward indie developers. Uh, there are a lot of people here who I know have more experience than that. But um, I'll just uh, quickly say uh, hi to anybody on the internet or in alt space who views this later. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to cover is uh, adaption, how you adapt into a low light environment, um, how you uh, might tweak a twilight environment or a nighttime environment. Um, and then just to lead out, or lead into uh, what the discussion. Um, I, thinking about things like uh, the movie The Matrix and how much of that happens, uh, there's real world and uh, virtual world, but many of the scenes there happen in the virtual world, but they're all low light. The, the real world ones occur in low light also, um, many of them. But um, also think of Snow Crash and the city lights, and I think there's a motorcycle scene that happens at night. Um, you think of Rainbow's End uh, and the tunnel scenes in that. So authors like this. Uh, in the book we all got at check-in, uh, think of Ready Player One, uh, Artemis's entrance. And she has, um, she's a silhouette in the entrance to a cave. Again, a low-light situation. So looking at the first aspect of this, adjusting to darkness, um, the main parts of this are when you come into a low light situation, and then how you handle kind of the transition into low light in your environment, what, what it looks like to be in a low light situation. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that works. So putting on the rift, coming from a normal uh, environment, uh, external environment, like an office or a home, the, um, the situation is, or the, the external environment is fairly bright, and it takes a little while for your eyes to adapt. So uh, one aspect is putting on the rift, and then another one would be when you're in the rift and you're moving from a bright scene to a dimmer scene. Again, it's going to take time to adapt, and uh, depending on where you end up, what the lighting environment is in that environment, you may have to look at how uh, the colors adapt also. So uh, in nature, 
it normally, your eye is geared to uh, change as the sun sets. That's the most common occurrence evolutionarily you'd be exposed to for changing light. It doesn't happen all that often that you have a rapid change of light. Like three, 4,000 years ago, we weren't exposed to that. Sunset takes about an hour, and that's what your eye is more or less adapted to. Um, so the rods in your eye, the part that's dark sensing, takes a while to come online. Um, so the first thing you want to do to have a good uh, experience for your user as they're coming into a dark environment is to try and let them acclimate. Um, and that can take, uh, there's several different approaches, but the two main ones I looked at are if you are doing demos, say for a number of people or just one important person, you can, the obvious one is dim the lights in the real world environment to let them pre-acclimate. Um, it's kind of obvious, but bears saying. Um, and if you've got multiple users, then while the first person is in, other people are dark adjusting. But the other way is um, if they're going uh, from one scene to another, a harsh cut is not the right way to go. Even a fade to black and then change scenes probably isn't the best way to adapt people. So giving them time in game to move from one environment to another environment um, helps with the dark adaptation. So a couple examples from those uh, apps that, uh, that uh, I was showing earlier. So in Luna Station, there's a, uh, a main bay that's well lit. Um, and Luna Station overall is a kind of a dark ride type of format where you're being pulled slowly through the environment. So you get pulled into the planetarium. And um, in real life, actually, I've been in a planetarium where the, basically there's one door and you're in the dark area. Uh, what we did was we had a, a hallway, you can see it there, <coughs> with the planetarium in a dark adapted environment at the far end. And you were pulled slowly from the bright environment through the hallway and you notice the red lights there. The red lights don't affect dark adaptation. So um, your eyes are acclimating to the darker environment while you're being pulled through the hallway. And you know it's a slow pull, but it's better than an abrupt change. Real ad adaptation, like I said, takes a long, much longer period than that. Um, but this helps them on their way, helps the uh, player on their way. Also, um, if you go into pastoral, that's an example of coming into um, from the real world coming into a dim environment. Pastoral takes place at kind of a twilight. A lot of people say it's early morning uh, because there's more activity starting than in the evening. Um, but when you come in, the first thing you notice is on your right is this large logo and it's placed kind of askew to the user. So the user tends to rotate into it and then you know, examine it. And while they're examining it, they're dark adapting to the larger environment. So it gives them something in the foreground to uh, take a look at while they're dark adapting. Um, it's probably there a little too long. We're still working on that. And, and the sudden cut for its disappearance is a little bit, uh, could be improved also, I'll say. And also we chose kind of this reddish, it's actually copper, but it could be like a reddish wood also, again, to help with the dark adaptation. So the transition into darkness uh, also uh, changes uh, the feel of colors. So that middle picture is what's going on at twilight. The top is a normal full light environment, a daylight environment. Um, and then the bottom, uh, actually the way we perceive it is a blue and black instead of a white and black picture. Um, but the, uh, the middle picture is representative of twilight. And what happens is the saturation of the colors is diminished. It moves towards like a neutral gray. And then blues are brought online. Um, which seems to be something between the cones, which are the, the are, they're the bright light sensors, and the, the rods, which are the low light sensors. Um, the blues of the cones, are, it seems that when the rods come online, they affect the blue uh, uh, cones, which gives it this blue tint. So we'll look at how you adjust into twilight and use that knowledge, uh, along with other things, to adjust the twilight scene here. Um, improving the twilight scene can really help with the realism overall of the impression of this, the twilight scene. Um, or, uh, let's see. So uh, looking at uh, the scene in general, one thing that uh, happens often is uh, the non-playing characters don't get adjusted for lower light situations. So in this instance, uh, or in an instance for twilight, 
uh, you could picture two players, uh, uh, an, a player playing against an archer, for instance, uh, where both have a 100 meter range. And uh, the scene changes from uh, daylight to nighttime. And the, in the nighttime scene, the non-playing character still has the 100 meter range. But the playing character, <coughs> excuse me, playing character can't see that far. So it's, it becomes unbalanced, very un, unnerving to the playing character. So we'll look at um, how to adjust the twilight scene, aside from behavioral aspects of, of the player character, um, in the context of uh, pastoral. So when we went in to adjust things on pastoral, there were a bunch of variables, and we were trying to figure out what uh, were the key elements to look at. Um, the first thing we looked at overall was the lighting. And uh, in the upper uh, right, you see the, uh, the directional source for the scene. This is Unity 5. The directional source for the scene was placed basically over where the real life uh, position of the illumination would be occurring from. And we adjusted the color of the light also. Um, so the, the perception was that even though it was lower light, everything was coming from the right direction. And um, for those of you who ha haven't been in remote areas like this is supposed to take place in, you can see shadows in a moonlit environment. Um, and they turn out to be fairly significant for the perception of where things are and how the lay of the land sits. Um, in the second set of uh, panes there with the wolf, um, the top element is how we brought the wolf into the scene initially. Uh, it was using an unlit shader in, in Unity. and it, it basically was supernova wolf. It was very bright. <clears throat> um, and uh, you know we obviously didn't want that. So we went to the standard shader. And that turned out to be a lot better, uh, very realistic. Uh, for a matter of fact, a little too realistic. So as the wolf would run through dark areas of the scene, uh, we'd lose the wolf. And that affected gameplay. So we actually brought in ambient light. Um, again, a similar tone to the moonlight, but a little bit uh, more on the blue side. Um, to light up the coat when the, the coat was facing uh, the user, but away from the moonlight. Um, the good part, so that's where we actually ended up with uh, pastoral. And the goal of this is we want to get that wolf into uh, the state where you feel like you're present with the wolf. We're not there yet. It's very cartoony. It's, a, uh, it's a, an asset you know, from the asset store uh, with some modifications for the coat. Um, but that's where we're heading. Uh, so in that light, what we did was, um, in the scene overall, we were looking at um, the wolf passing through dark areas of the environment. And we didn't want to artificially brighten up, the, uh, brighten up the wolf. So we were looking for a way to put point sources into the scene so that um, it would feel natural, but at the same time brighten up certain areas. And, uh, Jesse, my partner at uh, Horn and Ivory, came up with the idea of putting lanterns around the scene, um, such that it looked like the player, before the game started, put the lanterns around as an aid to, to seeing what was going to go on during the game. Um, in a future rendition, we plan to move those lanterns into, uh, uh, or make it the player's option to place the lanterns, uh, a little bit more strategy involved. But what the lanterns did for us was um, now when the wolf would move through the lower light areas, um, we could use light probes on the wolf, and the wolf's coat would come up to be brighter in those areas. And it greatly enhanced people being able to track where the wolf was in a twilight type of environment. So this is a, a, a slide I used for reference, actually, while I uh, have been working with these scenes. And I'm putting it here just because people may want to. Uh, to reference it in the future. A lot of it has come from different websites uh, that put these forward. But um, you know, the, the, the brute force way of approaching lighting is just start with a white light, and sometimes it never gets varied. And what I'll, what I'll say is by changing the sources of light and their texture or their RGB values, um, it changes the feel and the realism of the scene. Um, so for Moonlit, I've got the, the values up there that worked well for us. Um, and uh, there's several others there, too, for indoor environments and things like that. The other thing to notice with this is the, uh, the relative luminosity, the, what I have la labeled there as approximate 
lux. Um, and the idea there is just that they're orders of magnitude and difference. You can just think of this as the slider for the luminosity on the, uh, on the lighting source. But it, it gives you a feel for where you should be setting things. Now, I'm not going to go into this very much, but often when you're looking for a lighting source, uh, you can look at the commercial websites to find out real life lights and what their uh, temperature is, the temperature of the light, uh, which is measured in Kelvin. And um, you can uh, Google around for how to convert that into RGB values. This is pseudocode uh, from, uh, of something I found on another website. So finally, um, one thing that really improves uh, the way uh, natural, well, the way silhouettes work in, uh, or the way lighting, <laughs> the way uh, twilight is perceived uh, in a low light scene is the use of uh, silhouettes. And silhouettes occur uh, frequently when you have a bright source uh, in front of a dim foreground object. And what you can do is replace that with a 2D image if the, uh, if the image is uh, far, far enough away from the user. Uh, the reason you'd want to do this, perceptually, it's going to be very similar to what you'd get by having the 3D object out there. But you save memory and you increase the performance speed, which will help a lot, again, with achieving presence. Um, we use this in Luna Station, uh, where now Luna orbits around the moon. But in the, uh, some of our test uh, mock-ups, we had Luna around the Earth. And you could look down, and we had the International Space Station go by underneath you. Um, and it was a little silhouette, basically, going across the space. There was no need for a something more dramatic than that. Um, it's also worth uh, talking a little about the, the way you can get some depth out of the silhouettes, uh, which is to work with atmospheric effects. You can put uh, fog into your environment, <coughs> and the brain will perceive things that are farther away by the color of the silhouette being a little lighter. Um, you can also move things that pass by each other um, by looking at, uh, by placing the silhouettes at different distances. So in uh, Pastoral, the coyote and the trees actually can work that way. OK, so the last thing I want to talk about is uh, when you're not at total darkness, because you could just use a blindfold for that, but when you're near total darkness. And um, you know, there's a lot to learn about working in near darkness. Um, and we'll talk a little about uh, R&D topics uh, just in passing. There are many, but uh, uh, probably not. This isn't the. Uh, There'll be future talks on uh, very low light environments, I'm sure. Um, first, the first thing to notice is when you're using the Rift, uh, most people are aware of, you know, you can see the keyboard around your nose. Um, there's also a ventilation panel up on the top, and both of those will blow out a scene, uh, a low light scene. Um, it just provides too much uh, ambient light coming in inside the Rift. So you either have to dim the outside lights if you're working in an office environment on something like this or somehow mask that light. Um, but as far as research goes, um, there have been several topics I've talked about with people here, so I won't, uh, won't talk about people's future work or anything. But um, I've noticed that there seem to be positive effects with the uncanny valley uh, at lower light levels. And um, it would be interesting to see more work done in that area. Uh, and the other was with uh, rods and presence. Uh, rods have a longer latency and a very high sensitivity to even down to one photon making sense. And whether uh, presence happens in the, like the higher levels of the visual cortex, but it would be good to know if the technical parameters for presence change uh, based on um, th uh, whether the rods or the cones are being used. So, the last two things I want to touch on with uh, talking about near total darkness uh, are uh, the non-visual cues that can be used to help with a scene uh, and help the, the player kind of get used to what's going on in the environment. So with positional audio, most people are aware of what this is, but uh, in case people are listening on the internet who aren't familiar with it, what positional audio allows you to do is place a sound source in three space, and it will remain stable. 
So it's different than stereo. You'll be using stereo headphones, but it will, as you turn, it will uh, stay stable and you'll have the right thing, the correct thing in each ear, depending on where you're looking. Um, it's kind of like immersive VR, but for audio. Uh, so, or immersive visual, but for audio. So you can picture it kind of uh, like uh, when kids are playing this game Marco Polo and one person's it and other people are trying to be, are trying to avoid being tagged. And one person yells Marco, the other people yell Polo. And, um, you know, the, the person who's trying to tag the rest of the crowd is basically listening for where the uh, people are in three space to go tag them. Uh, positional audio would do that same effect or have that same effect and act, that actually might make an interesting game in VR at some point, um, low light VR. Um, in pastoral, what we did was we used um, positional audio in very low light environments. So the twilight environment you just saw is bright enough that you wouldn't need something like this. But in a very dark environment, it was difficult to spot where the wolf was in the area around you. And by the time you saw it, it was usually too late. So we added these audio triggers around the environment. And the basic idea is as the wolf put, uh, would go through an area, they would set off a trigger like rustling grass or snapping a twig or um, startling some birds in a thicket. And all those are in the thing that's in Oculus Share. Um, so when, you, when you'd hear something like that, uh, automatically almost the user would turn to the right spot. And once they were looking in the right spot, uh, then they were fine. They could usually discern uh, what was going on in a particular area. In lower light, the way the, the retina works is you're looking more for movement than for focusing down on an object. So it was more a case of looking for the movement of where the wolf was. So then finally, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about emotions in darkness and um, the fact that it's easier to evoke emotions because you're able to focus better on what's going on internally when there's not a lot of other things going on around you. So for storytellers and others who are looking at uh, evoking empathy, I think uh, I saw a journalism talk at uh, SVBR on evoking empathy using emotions. Um, Low light uh, is a good environment for, for approaching this. So the framework I used when I was looking at uh, evoking emotions in uh, low light environments was one, <coughs> excuse me, one of um, you could set up uh, the expectation of uh, neutral or punishment or reward and then look at how um, the emotional response would be triggered. And since it's, uh, since the user is more sensitive in uh, lower light situations, it would pretty effectively bring out emotional content. So in punishment, or punishment, yeah, punishment st style, <coughs> excuse me, style um, um, uh, scenarios, it would bring out fear. And that fear was coming from a threat. So picture like if the, if the player was in fear of their life or they were losing possessions or they were losing hit points or whatever measure you want, um, that would put them in a state of uh, anxiety depending on their impression of how bad the punishment would be. Um, it's also the case that if you held them, <clears throat> held them in that uh, environment for too long, uh, you'd lead to dread, which could end up with people uh, jumping out of game because it's a little too intense when there isn't enough counter stimulation. Um, so in a neutral environment, um, think of this more like uh, ho hopefully how people feel when they're heading to bed, right? It's a, it's a safe environment. It leads to a calm feeling and uh, uh, something where people can just relax. Uh, it turns out in pastoral, uh, we got several requests to provide the environment free of wolves because people just wanted to be in the environment, listen to the crickets, you know, have a nice, uh, enjoyable time in the foothills. Uh, something for those of you in northern climates in the winter, download Pastoral and uh, have a calm time there. <laughs> um, and then finally, um, if you're uh, soliciting or surrounding the user with the opportunity for reward, um, that led to excitement uh, and 
uh, it was kind of tied to this unknown, the sense of the unknown. Uh, think of like an Easter egg hunt in the dark. People were trying to, say, acquire objects or, um, you know, uh, have, uh, have a positive experience in low light situations. Um, and that led to an increased sense of, uh, of uh, excitement. So overall, we've covered a bunch of techniques. And um, I think we can uh, view the saying as a metaphor maybe for where we are with uh, VR, as well as talking about darkness. But uh, uh, as we move to the commercial market, I think a lot of people will be coming out of the darkness as to what's, uh, what we've all been so excited about for the last couple of years. So I look forward to seeing some of this maybe applied in future projects of yours, and hope to hear from you if uh, any of it's used. Thanks very much. I can take a couple questions, I guess. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the uh, I have a mic for you. Oh, I'll repeat this one and then. About Sorry. The You talked about techniques that um, you talked about both halves. You know, you emulate um, what the eye feels like in low light, but you also talk about you know when your eye actually is low light adapted. Do you, do eyes actually get low light adapted in in your game or in your experience? Does you know, um, it or do they? Do, are you always like emulating that that behavior? The the blue light. Um, that's actually an excellent question. Um, so when you come in, uh, you're not dark adapted right away. Um, we, we don't make that adjustment, although that's a very good thing to pursue. Um, you are correct that if s people stay in the environment for on the order of half an hour playing, I was surprised that people stay in that long. It's a very, it's meant to be kind of a Farmville type of experience, very slow paced. The wolf turns up every you know, two to five minutes. It's low key except for you know, those times when it bursts out of the darkness and does something. Um, so they do have enough time to go a long way down a path to dark adaption. We don't actually make that change. When, when uh, they're in world or in game, it goes to that uh, blue highlight, dim but blue highlight tone and stays there. Um, it would be interesting to look at how we could change that over time so they actually do go to dark adaptation. Thanks for the question. Can't see. Is there uh, anything else? It's hard to see down here, incidentally. Uh, do you lose uh, much dynamic range in, from the display? Um, is there enough dynamic <laughs> range in the display? You know that that the there just wasn't enough time to cover everything. But tone compression. I had a whole section in tone compression, and it just I, there was no way I could fit it all in there. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a talk for another day if you want to talk afterwards. But I would encourage everybody to look at uh, you know, H, uh, HDR and look at tone compression and look at uh, inside of Unity how they do the HDR tone compression. Um, it can add a lot, especially in daylight scenes where you have dark components. Now, that's, that's not rod-based stuff, but uh, it can add a lot of extra texture to your scene. So great question, but I don't think we've got, it was 10 minutes, I think, in the talk that I cut out. So, so yes, follow up with that, or if, uh, if you can't reach me, check it out on, on the web. Anything else? Okay, I think we're right up against break time, so uh, enjoy.